turn back to Matthew chapter 4, if you remember last time we were here, I went through the temp temptations of, of Christ, and uh, we looked at those, and we looked at them in the context of, you know, when Jesus recited those scriptures, you know, where did those scriptures come from, and why did he use those scriptures, and what, you know, how did they relate to the situation, and we went through that, um, but I want to I pick up from that, and um, be honest with you, what are, where I want to get to this morning is going to be Matthew chapter 8, so I just want to for context, pick up at the end of uh, chapter 4 and just read through it really quickly, and then we're going to be turning over to, to Matthew chapter 8. And I'll just tell you up front that obviously there's a couple chapters in between 4 and 8, right? Uh, which would be 5, 6, and 7. And 5, 6, and 7 happen to be the uh, Beatitudes, the Sermon on the Mount and the Beatitudes, and that's a, a fairly lengthy um, section of text, and I didn't want to attempt to try and go through that and rush through that today and, and want just one message that I'm filling in for Pastor Ritt. And so we're going to skip over that, and we're going to jump ahead to chapter 8 and pick it up from there. Um, so are we all set? Are we all good? Ready to go? All right, bow our heads and our hearts one more time. And Lord, we just ask you again that you would be with us and bless us through the teaching of your word. Lord, calm our hearts, calm our minds, remove the distractions. Allow your words to sink deep into our hearts and change us, Lord, forever, forever change us. And just renew that promise, Lord, that you have taken us, you have sealed our hearts for that day, Lord. And give you praise in your precious name. Amen. Amen. So we're going to pick up um, in 4, verse 12, Matthew 4, 12. And in, if you, you know, verse 11, you remember, he says, and then the devil left him at the end of the temptations and the angels came and ministered to him. And then in 12, it says, now when Jesus heard that John had been put into prison, he departed to Galilee and leaving Nazareth, he came and dwelt in Capernaum. So remember some of these names here, Nazareth, Capernaum, which is by the sea in the regions of Zebulon and Naphtali, that it might be fulfilled, which was spoken by Isaiah, the prophet saying, the land of Zebulun and the land of Naphtali, by the way of the sea beyond the Jordan, Galilee of the Gentiles, the people who sat in darkness have seen a great light, and upon those who sat in the region and the shadow of death, a light has dawned. And from that time, Jesus began to preach and say, repent, for the kingdom of heaven is at hand. So this is a point where now Jesus has gone through the temptation. He's, he's been baptized. He's gone through his temptations. And now he's going to begin that three-year earthly ministry. All right. Interesting that he starts it up in the Galilee. He leaves the area of Judea and heads up to the Galilee. So he gets up to the Galilee, and in uh, verse 18, it says, And Jesus, walking by the sea of Galilee, saw two brothers, Simon, called Peter, and Andrew, his brother, casting a net into the sea, for they were fishermen. And then he said to them, Follow me, and I will make you fishers of men. They immediately left their nets and followed him. And going on from there, he saw two other brothers, James, the son of Zebedee, and John, his brother, in the boat with Zebedee, their father, mending their nets, and he called them. And immediately they left their boat and their father and followed him. All right, so if you go to some of the other uh, Gospels, you'll, there's a little more information that you can go to. I don't really have time to go to that right now. But if, you're, if you remember reading maybe, in, I think it's in Mark, um, where you know, Jesus, he, he, when he encounters Peter and Andrew the first time, he, he says he wants to get into the boat because he wants to go out and, and, and teach. Um, and so there's a little more to it, right? Because this is where he, he tells them that, you know, hey, Peter, uh, throw, your, throw your net out. And, and, and Peter's like, oh, man, we've been toiling. I've been working on these nets and everything. Really? I mean, we haven't fished all night. We've got nothing. And so, but he does, okay. And he throws his net out and he brings in the, the great haul of fish. That's at the same time. This is, doesn't go into it in this text, but, but that happens at the same time that this is going on. All right. So then in verse 23, and Jesus went all about Galilee, teaching in their synagogues, preaching the gospel of the kingdom and healing all kinds of sickness and all kinds of de disease among the people. Then his fame went throughout all Assyria, and they brought him all sick people and, uh, who were afflicted with various diseases and torments, and those who were demon-possessed, epileptic, epileptics and paralytics, and he healed them. And great multitudes followed him from Galilee, from Decapolis, from Jerusalem, Judea, and beyond the Jordan. So this, his great fame goes out. 
And, and all these people now, the multitudes begin to follow him wherever he goes. All right, and he's sealing, uh, healing these people, healing from various sicknesses. And it says he's casting out demons. We're going to see that again. Um, but great multitudes follow him. And it says from the Galilee, which was the region that he's in. Uh, and it says also from Decapolis. And if anybody know where Decapolis is, the area of Decapolis. No? Okay. Well, we're going to get a map out, and we're going to show you where that is. Um, and Jerusalem, you know where Jerusalem, Judea, the area of Judea, and beyond the Jordan. So these are just areas I want you to kind of keep in your mind. Nazareth, Capernaum, Decapolis, um, you know where Jerusalem, Judea, beyond the Jordan is. But just kind of keep those in mind, because they're all going to come into play here uh, as we go further into this message. And then in verse 5, or, I'm sorry, chapter 5, verse 1, he says, Seeing the multitudes... He went up on a mountain, and when he was seated, his disciples came to him. All right, so this is the beginning of the Beatitudes. He goes up on the Mount of Beatitudes, all right? So I'm going to, as I said, I'm going to skip over that. We're going to go to ver, uh, chapter 8, and you will see what does chapter 8 start with. And when he came down the mountain, okay? So we're skipping the whole section from when he went up the mountain to where he comes back down. All right, so this is where we're at. So you kind of have a background context of what we're talking about. And when he had come down the mountain, great multitudes followed him. And behold, a leper came and worshiped him, saying, Lord, if you are willing, you can make me clean. And then Jesus put out his hand and touched him, saying, I am willing, be cleansed. And immediately the leper was cleansed. And Jesus said to him, See that you tell no one, but go your way, show yourself to the priest, and, other, and offer the gift that Moses commanded as a testimony to them. So now this leper comes down, and he encounters Jesus, and he says he wants to be healed. So the, as you probably know, the, the, the problem with leprosy is that Nobody wanted these lepers around, right? They were afraid they were going to catch it themselves. So anytime a leper came around, they had to announce that they were unclean. And generally when they did that, there would be a big, you know, the crowds would disperse because they didn't want to be around the leper. All right, so he comes in, and you already know there's a great multitude following him. They followed him up the mountain. They followed him back down the mountain. So he's got this multitude of people. This leper comes on the scene. And he says he wants to be healed. And Jesus reaches out, and he cleanses him. He says, I'm willing. I'll heal you. And then what does he tell them to do? Keep, keep quiet. Keep this to yourself, right? So see that you tell no one and go your way and offer yourself, offer yourself to the priest and offer the gift that Moses commanded as a testimony to them. So now they had to go, he had to go to the temple and the, temp, and the temple priest had to certify that he was actually clean. He would, he would look him over and, and, you know, and determine whether or not he was actually clean of his leprosy. And if he did, then he would certify him and he could be brought back into the fold. All right, so you have to wonder now, why would Jesus do this? Why? Because we're going to see in some cases he told people, don't say anything. Don't. And then in other cases, in, in other places, which we're, we're going to get to a little bit further in the text, we're going to see where he said, go out and tell everybody. So why? Well, you know, and those, these things, just, you know, they're head scratchers for me. And, and so I try to look a little bit further. And, you know, nobody really, I think, has a definitive answer as why he told the leper to not say anything. But there are a couple of speculations, and I think a couple of them are, are probably valid. Um, and one of them is that um, if, if he told, if he went out and told everybody that he was cleansed of his leprosy, um, then who's going to come to him? All the lepers are going to come. And where are the people going to go? And they're all going to go away. And so he, you know, and I don't know. You know I don't know if this is valid. I'm just telling you what I've read on some other places. Um, you know, and so Jesus wanted to, to, to minister to the, to the people and to the multitudes. Well, if all the lepers are gone, or all the lepers are there, well, all the people are going to go. I don't know, because Jesus could heal, heal them all and, and solve that problem. So that could be legitimate. It, can, it might not be. Uh, it does say in one of the other Gospels that... Um, the first thing that the leper did do was went out and told everybody. Okay, so he told them not to, but it's the first thing he did is he went out and told everybody. And then it goes on further to say, because the leper went out and told everybody, the great multitudes came to him and he could no longer even enter the city. Okay, because he was being so mobbed and he had to dwell out into the wilderness. So there might be some legitimacy to that argument. I got a little bit tongue-tied. Um, 
But, but another one which we read, which could be, I think could be another valid one, was that uh, how did, how did the, the priests, the temple priests and the Pharisees, and scribes and Pharisees feel about Jesus? They didn't like him, did they? He's kind of stepping on their territory, they felt like, right? And, and so they didn't like him. So if, if a leper came and he went to the priest and he said, this guy Jesus healed me, what do you think they're going to do? Are they going to validate Jesus' ministry? Probably not. And so, I mean, there's a good possibility he told them not to do that. Go get your ghost to the priest, get your, you know, certify that you're clean. And then after that, you know, you, if, you, if you want to say something, you can say something. But don't say anything right up. So anyway, just thought that was kind of interesting. And you think about why he told some people to say, you know, go out and tell what happened. And other people, he said, don't. Uh, but we're going to see... Uh, later here uh, that he actually did tell them to go out and, and tell them what happened. All right, so let's, let's move on in 8.5. Um, it says, when Jesus had entered Capernaum, a centurion came to him and pleading with him, saying, Lord, my servant is lying at home paralyzed, dreadfully tormented. And Jesus said to him, I will come and heal him. And the centurion answered and said, Lord, I am not worthy that you should come under my roof, but only speak a word, and my servant will be healed. For I also am a man under authority, having soldiers under me. And I say to this one, go, and he goes, and to another, come, and he comes. And to my servant, do this, and he does it. When Jesus heard it, he marveled and said to those who followed, Assuredly, I say to you, I have not found such great faith, not even in Israel. And I say to you that many will come from east and west and sit down with Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob in the kingdom of heaven. But the sons of the kingdom will be cast out into outer darkness, and there will be weeping and gnashing of teeth. And then Jesus said to the centurion, Go your way. As you have believed, so let it be done for you. And his servant was healed that same hour. So he's saying that, you know, this great faith that this Gentile uh, has exhibited, he said that because of that, I'm telling you that there's going to be lots of Gentiles that come, Gentiles from the east and the west that are going to come. But the sons of Abraham, the sons of Israel, a lot of them, they don't believe that they're caught up in their works and, and they're not going to have the faith and they're not going to have the belief and they're going to actually be cast out and there's going to be weeping and, and gnashing of teeth. And I think it's interesting because in verse 13 where he says, Jesus said to the centurion, go your way as you have believed. He believed, right? And as Abraham believed God, he counted it to him for righteousness, right? Same thing is going on here. The centurion wasn't trying to work he wasn't trying to do anything for works. He just simply believed that Jesus could do it. He demonstrated that faith, and it was done for him. And I'm not a name it and claim it, so don't think that I'm going there. Um, but in this particular case, he believed that Jesus could do it, and he did. All right, and then we're going to move on in verse 14. He said, And when Jesus had come into Peter's house, he saw his wife's mother lying sick with a fever, so he touched her hand, and the fever left her. And she arose and she served them. And continuing on, when evening had come, they brought to him many who were demon possessed and he cast out spirits with a word and he healed all who were sick that it might be fulfilled, which was spoken by Isaiah the prophet saying, he himself took our infirmities and bore our sicknesses. So it's interesting because in multiple places now, we've seen that there's all these demon-possessed people, right? And just this demon-possessed people seem to be everywhere all of a sudden. And, and so I was reading a little bit on that. And basically this time in Israel, there really wasn't a whole lot of faith. Uh, there had the re religiosity, um, but there wasn't a whole lot of real belief. There wasn't a whole lot of trust. They actually have the Messiah kind of right in their face, and they're going to reject him. And, and the further and further you move away from God, what door are you opening? Yeah, you're, you're, opening, you're opening the wrong door of spirituality, right? You're going to open the door and allow the, you know, the evil and the, 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 the demonology, demonology in. And, and as you can see, I mean, where we are in this country today, I mean, we have progressively over the decades, 
you know, try and eliminate God from our society. And the more we do that, we're seeing the spiraling, out of control, you know, degradation of our, our culture. I mean, it's just very obvious. You can watch it. It's unraveling right in front of our very faces. And we might not be seeing all this real demonic activity yet, but it's going to come. I mean, it's going to come. I mean, just like here, as, as Israel moved further and further away from God, as they reject, you know, their Messiah, their Lord, then demonic oppression is going to come in. And we're on the cusp of that, it appears, in this country. So, you know, be ready for it because uh, it looks like it's coming. Uh, but if you're in Christ, man, you don't got to worry about that, right? Uh, they can't, they can't, they, Satan can't lay a finger on your head that God hasn't allowed but I think it's very interesting um, that this is all going on and Jesus is healing all these demon-possessed people. But it does say in verse 17, he himself took our infirmities and bore our sicknesses. So what does that mean? Does that mean he just like healed people and there was nothing to it? Or did it cost him something? I mean, it cost him something, right? I mean, it says it right here. And, and he, Matthew is, is quoting right out of um, the, the forbidden text, right? Isaiah chapter 53 here, where he says he bore our infirmities and he, or he took our infirmities and he bore our sicknesses. So there, it cost Jesus something to do this. This wasn't just free, you know, okay? It, didn't, it wasn't just like nothing happened. There was, there was some repercussions that he was feeling. Just like if you remember when he was walking down the road and the crowds were around him and there was the woman with the issue of blood, right? And out of the crowd, she just grabs his helm. He knew it. Something went out of me. Who touched me? What do you mean who touched you? You got people crowded around you, people you know, bumping into you and this and you go, no, no, no. Somebody touched me. Somebody touched me and got healed. So, so it cost something. You know, not, not everything that, you know, that he takes on is free. Now, he's paid it all. He's already paid the ultimate cost, right? But just think about that. Just think about what that, what that cost was for our sin. Okay, something went out of him. It, it cost him something to do that. And then we move on in verse 18. It says, And when Jesus saw great multitudes about him, he gave a command to depart to the other side. So this is kind of similar to the, what I mentioned earlier, where the, um, the leper was healed and he went out and he told everybody. And so the crowds were, you know, it was, he was so crowded with people around him that he couldn't even go into the city. Well, now he's, he's so crowded. There's so many, you know, such big crowds around him that he's giving a command to go to the other side. Go to the other side of what? He's going to go to the other side of the Galilee. Okay, that makes sense, right? So he's going to go to the other side. And of course, as Jesus typically does, when he's going to go somewhere, he's just doing it because that's just something to do, right? He always has a purpose, right? So, so it's not like he's just like, well, I'm going to give you a command to go to the other side. He, he's got a reason he's going to go to the other side, all right? And as, and as you remember in, in John's gospel, as we're going, you know, finishing up uh, John's gospel, earlier in John's gospel, in chapter 4, he was going to travel up to the Galilee, and, and the Jews always went across the Jordan, and they went up the east side of the Jordan, and they cut back up into the region of the Galilee because they didn't want to go through they didn't want to go through Samaria because the Samarians were the half-breeds, right? They, you know, they're not good enough for us. You know, they're from the other side of the tracks, you know, so we're not going to go into Samaria. But the text tells us that, but Jesus needed to go to Samaria. And he needed to go for, because the great multitudes were there, right? He went for one. One. And we're going to see here in a little bit that Jesus had to go to the other side. He's given a command to cross over to the other side because there was somebody over there. Actually, there was a couple of people he wanted to touch over there. But he was going over for a reason. It wasn't just haphazard. But he gives a command that we're going to go to the other side. And then look at the very verse, next verse, chapter, uh, verse 19. It says, Then a certain scribe came and said to him, Teacher, I will follow you wherever you go. Now, why do you think that verse would be right after I gave a command to go to the other side? Who is this guy? He's a scribe, which makes him a, a Jewish leader, right? He, he's upper echelon, right? He's a scribe. And Jesus says, I'm going to the other side. Well, what's on the other side? Not Samaria. He's, he's, he's going across the Galilee into a very pagan culture, okay? Why would a scribe want to go over there? 
Okay, but this guy in, I guess in his heart, feels like he's following Jesus and he wants to follow Jesus. And so the scribe says, you're going to go to the other side. I'm telling you, I'm going with you. I'm going to go with you. All right, so it, it, there's a little more to it than just that because you have this religious, you know, pious religious leader that actually is going to go to the other side. And you remember, you remember the, the Good Samaritan, right? And here's the guy, and, and they all were, right? They didn't want to go near him, right? But here this guy says, I'll go over there with you. He doesn't, he doesn't know what's awaiting him over there. You guys probably do because you've read ahead and you, you know. <laughs> but, um, but anyways, just interesting that he said he'll go. And then Jesus' response to him is, foxes have holes and birds of the air have nests, but the Son of Man has nowhere to lay his head. Hey, I just want to let you know that you're, you know, my lifestyle might not be what's, <laughs> you know, what appeals to you. Uh, you, you say you're going to go with me, but I just want to let you know, I, I really don't. I, I, materially, I don't have a whole lot to offer to you. Okay, I'm not going to give you a whole lot. So there's, you know, foxes have holes, birds of the air. And so he discourages them to some extent. You, you have to imagine that this is his response is because he's discouraging this guy to go with him. Right. And, and he continues on. He says, and another of his disciples said to him, Lord, let me first go and bury my father. And Jesus said, follow me and let the dead bury their own dead. Okay. Um, and so, again, there's this discouragement um, because, you know, you have, to, um, you have to conclude here that this guy's father is not actually dead yet. And we really don't know how, how old his father is. Is this like, is it going to be a decade from now? Is it going to be next week? Is it gonna, you know what I'm saying? It could be any, any undefined period of time that this could be that this guy's like, well, yeah, I will follow you, but, you know, not yet. You know, just, just give, me, give me a little time. I'm, I'm not really ready quite yet to follow you, but I'll follow you. But just not yet. Okay? And so, so this, these are the responses. Now, what's interesting, and if you go and you look in some of the other Gospels, which we don't have time to do right now, so I'll just tell you that the account is very similar. It doesn't say that either of these two left. And it doesn't say they actually went with him. So we don't know what their actual response was to this. But it's implied that they probably departed and didn't go with him, okay? And we don't, they're not mentioned as he goes across either. So we, we don't know, but it's implied that he didn't. Now, what's interesting about this is that what is, what is the basic um, goal of most larger ministries in the U.S. today? Money, Money and let's get the numbers in here, right? Because, boy, that's, that's success, right? Well, here, you got great multitudes following around Jesus. And anytime you see this like great multitude, he's, yeah, he, he's like, do you really want to follow me? Do you really want to follow me? Because this is what it's going to cost, right? This isn't going to be an easy thing. All right. So if you go to one of these, you go to one of these churches and are like, just bring all your problems to Jesus and he'll take care of them all. Whatever's your finances, you're sick, you got, you know, job, whatever, just come to Jesus. He'll take care of that's not what the message is in the, in the gospel here. It says, look at this, follow me. You need to follow me because there's a, you need an eternal spiritual healing, right? But, but it doesn't necessarily mean I'm going to take care of all your problems that you've created along the way here. Right now, there's going to be repercussions that are going to come along that you're going to have to deal with. And a lot of us carry baggage with us and we'll carry it with us until the day that we're ultimately completely healed, right? We all have it. Everybody knows. I mean, if, you can, if you can raise your hand and say, I got no baggage, I'm telling you you're in the wrong place, okay? Because <laughs> we all have got baggage. This world has affected us and we all carry baggage. Um, but, but we know that we ultimately have a, a eternal hope beyond this place and Jesus has touched our hearts and that's where we're going okay and he will get us through right all right so the message isn't just come to Jesus and he'll fix all your problems come to Jesus and he will give you new life that's the message he will give you a way to deal with your problems he'll give you a way and a hope beyond this place all right so it's interesting because, you know, we see a lot of people who try to attract, um, attract their ministries, but um, attract people to their ministries. But here Jesus actually kind of discourages them. And so now he's going, he's given the command to cross the other side. So you think they're going to make it? Of course, and you've read ahead and you already know. <laughs> so they're going to make it, right? And you already know what's going to happen along the way. 
but we're going to read through it anyway. <clears throat> so in verse 23, it says, Now when he got into a boat, his disciples followed him. And suddenly a great tempest arose on the sea, so that the boat was covered with the waves. But he was asleep. Then his disciples came to him and awoke him, saying, Lord, save us. We are perishing. But he said to them, Why are you fearful, O you of little faith? And then he arose and rebuked the winds and the sea, and there was a great calm. So the men marveled, saying, Who can this be that even the winds and the sea obey him? So they got in the boat, disciples follow him, and suddenly there is this great tempest that arose on the sea. Uh, I don't know, anybody got a study Bible that tells you what some of these words are? Like great, does anyone like a great, does anyone know what that is? Megas. Megas, Megas, that's mega, right? Mega, big, huge, right? Really, really big. And, and what about tempest? What you got for that? Seismos. Seismos. That's interesting. Anybody know what the word seismos or where seismos might come from? Seismic? seismic? And what seismic activity is usually because the wind blew, right? Because of what? An earthquake. Yeah. So, so what this actually reads is now when he got into the seismic, and suddenly a mega seismic activity arose on the sea. Okay, this is the, that, that word seismos is used multiple places uh, throughout the New Testament, I think in the Old Testament as well. Uh, but the only place that they actually translate this as storm or tempest is right here. Everywhere else, it's an earthquake. It, it is a convulsing, an out of control convulsing of the sea is what's going on. All right, which could have been a result of a seismic activity, because the word is seismos. We don't know. The Galilee is prone to storms that come up very quickly, and, and the sea could get very rough very quickly. But, you know, Peter, if we know right now, Peter, Andrew, James, and John, you know, they hardly ever got out on the Galilee, right? So this was no big deal for them, right? These were seasoned fishermen, seasoned fishermen that spent their lives on this lake. They knew the storms that could arise, and they knew the storms that could arise in short order. This storm was like a storm they had never seen before. They have never seen the sea boil like it was boiling right here. Suddenly a great tempest arose on the sea, and the boat was covered with the waves, and Jesus was panicking. Nope, nope. Jesus was in the back and he was asleep. Okay? And then his disciples came to him and they woke him, saying, Lord, save us, we are perishing. So after the disciples spoke to him, Jesus became woke. <laughs> <laughs> Probably not. <laughs> no, just a joke. Uh, scratch that. You can erase that. So his disciples came to him and woke him, saying, Lord, Save us, we are perishing. So now you have to imagine that, uh, you know, what, what do you think they're doing with this massive tempest that's arose on this boat and the waves are crashing into the boat? What do you think they're, what do you think they're up to? <laughs> and they're, I would imagine they're in a panic. You know, they're in this massive panic. They don't know what to do. And, and then so think of what they're doing as works. They're trying to work their way through saving themselves here, right? And, and Jesus, he's in the back, and he's, he's asleep, right? He's not concerned with it anyway. He gave a command, hey, we're going to the other side, right? So what tempest comes into our lives that we, we get out the bailer? And we're bailing, and we're bailing, and we're bailing, and we're bailing, and it's, oh my gosh, it's falling apart, my world's coming apart, this flooding, the boat's going to go under, I'm going to die, I'm going to perish, this is all falling apart, what am I going to do? And God, you're just sleeping. You don't even care. You're not worried about it whatsoever. Do you ever feel like that? you ever feel like you're in the midst of a storm, and God's just asleep? 
Do you think maybe he was asleep and maybe he orchestrated this because he was trying to teach them something? You think maybe he orchestrated the trial so that he could increase their faith? And maybe he was asleep, but he wasn't? <laughs> Quite possibly. So they wake him up. Lord, we're perishing. Save us, save us, save us. So finally, after we bail and we bail and we bail and we're falling apart and we can't do it and we get, we're out of energy and the boat's still going under, finally we go, Jesus, please help me. Help me. Can you help me? And he says, why are you fearful, O oh, you of little faith? Why are you fearful, O oh, you of great works? Uh -uh. Why are you fearful, O oh, you of little faith? And then he arises and he rebukes the winds and the waves. And there was a great calm. When they finally turned to him, be anxious for nothing. But all things through prayer and supplication with thanksgiving, make your request be made out to God. And what happens then? The peace that surpasses all understanding will guard your hearts and your minds in Christ Jesus. We just have to turn to Him because He's trying, He takes us through these things. And, and this was a, a pretty big deal for them. And, and there's a lot of people that are going through a lot of trials. And we were praying about that just right before the service. A lot of people are going through some serious, serious trials. But God will take us through them. You know, he's going to take us through them. And he'll give us the peace and the calm to go through them. He rebuked and he, he rose. He rebuked the winds and the sea and there was a great calm. And so the men marveled. They marveled saying, who can this be that even the winds and the waves obey him? They marveled. It's like, who is this guy? So maybe there was even a little bit with them quite yet that didn't. I mean, we're connecting all the dots quite yet, right? And we're getting it all quite, quite yet. Who is this man? Well, then they get to the other side. And hang on, I'm real quick. Darren, can you, can you pull down the screen? Because I, I do want to see if I can do this right here and try to put a little bit of some of this in, in context. I told you to remember some places. Where did I try to tell you to remember? Capernaum, Capernaum. Decapolis. Decapolis, Judea, Jerusalem, right? Okay, I'm going to try and watch this technology. Woo! <laughs> All right, so you obviously can see this area of Judea is down here. You know, Jerusalem's right here. This is the Dead Sea, uh, Jericho. This is the Jordan River. Up here's the Sea of Galilee. And yeah, he's got the pointer. So up here, we're going to zoom in down up here. So this is the area of the Galilee. This is Capernaum, right on the very northwest shore of the Sea of Galilee. And just right about where the pointer is, a little bit to the west of Capernaum is the... Um, the Mount of Beatitudes. All right, so he left. He left the area of Judea. He goes up. He goes into Nazareth. And then from Nazareth, he goes to Capernaum. And then from Capernaum, he goes up onto the, onto the Mount of Beatitudes. And he gives them the, um, the, the Sermon on the Mount, the Mount of Beatitudes. And then he goes back down to Capernaum. And along the way, he meets the leper. And then he gets to Capernaum. And he encounters the centurion. Okay, and then after Saturian, he goes into Peter's house and he heals his mom, his mother-in-law. And uh, am I forgetting something? The scribe, yeah, the scribe, and they come to him. And, the, and that's after he gives the command, because so now he's got the crowds all around him. So he gives the command, we're going to go across the Sea of Galilee. So what he's actually going to do is he's going to go down from this area from Capernaum, and he's going to go to this area here where it's called Gergesa, all right? There's another area here called Gadara, and, uh, and I'll tell you where, what, why those come into play here. Uh, but here's Decapolis, okay? So this region of Decapolis um, is where a lot of people are being drawn to him up into Capernaum area. They're being drawn from here, the area of Syria, they're coming down, okay? So this is, this is kind of a map, kind of put in a context of where he is and what's going on. But he's going to go across the sea from here to there, okay? And that's when the great tempest occurs. All right, so I just wanted to kind of put that in, into context and, and remember this area here over here uh, called Decapolis. All right, this is the region um, of Israel during the time of Jesus. So that kind of gives you an idea of what we're looking at, okay? So let's pick it up really quick and we'll, uh, I, mean, I got another one I want to show you here in a minute. 
In verse 28, when he had come to the other side, to the country of Gergesenes, all right, and you got to study the Bible there that probably tells you that Gadarenes. Okay, so that's that area that I was pointing out, okay? Um, the other Gospels use the, 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 the term the Gadarenes. Um, for some reason, Matthew decided to use uh, uh, this term here, Gergesenes. Uh, but it's that region kind of on that w eastern uh, shore of the, the Galilee. All right, so that's where they're going. All right, and that's the area of Decapolis, which would be to the south, all right? So keep all this kind of logged in your brain here because we're going to take a look at something. Uh, and then he gets over there and he met, there met him two de demon-possessed men coming out of the tombs exceedingly fierce so that no one could pass that way. And suddenly they cried out saying, what have we to do with you, Jesus, you son of God? Have you come here to torment us before our time? Now, interesting, the last thing we saw, the disciples, they marveled, and they're asking themselves, who could this be? Well, the demons know who he is. The demons don't have any question whatsoever. They know who he is. He's, you know, who are you, son of God? Have you come here to torment us before our time? And now a good way off from them, there was a herd of many swine feeding. So the demons begged him, saying, if you cast us out, permit us to go away into the herd of swine. And he said to them, go. So when they had come out, they went into the herd of swine, and suddenly the whole herd of swine ran violently down the steep place and into the sea and perished in the water. Then those who kept them fled, and they went away into the city and told everything, including what had happened to the demon-possessed men. And behold, the whole city came out to meet Jesus, and when they saw him, they begged him to depart from their region. That's an interesting reaction, isn't it? So, they cry out, Son of man, what, what, have you, what are you here? You come to torment us before our time. There's this herd of swine. They're feeding. The demons begged us, cast us into the herd of swine. He tells them to do that. They go out of the, the, the demon-possessed men, and then the swine charge into the, into the sea. Now, it tells us in another gospel that, that when the people came back, uh, they, they saw this demon-possessed man who had been healed as well. So, yeah, in their right mind. Yeah, so they're now in their right mind. So they've witnessed now what had happened. Now, these are people that have gone and tried to bind these guys with chains, and they just break them. I mean, this is like a, a massive demonic, you know, possession here that's going on. And they have complete control of these men, and they're giving them superhuman strength. They cast them out. He casts them out. They see him in the right mind. Now, Jesus tells this guy in another gospel, I think in Mark, to go and tell everybody. Go and tell everybody what God did for you. Now, we're in a different place, right? We're in a different place, and we're not really in his region. But he tells them to go in and tell everybody. Now, we're also in that area of Decapolis, which our people have already been drawn to. So just kind of keep all this in, in the back of your mind. Um, but they, they come to him, and they see this guy that's been in his, or these people, that, these two men. Um, the other Gospels only re reference one of them. Um, but they, they see these two men in their right mind. They've been healed in a demonic possession. And they're like, Jesus, go away. Okay? So I want to show you something here. we got a, we got a minute. We can do this. I want you to turn to Numbers. Chapter 32. What side of the Jordan we on now? He's crossed over? East. <laughs> east. They're on the east side. East side of the Galilee, but they'd be on the east side of the Jordan as well. So look at Numbers chapter 32. Now the children of Reuben 
And the children of Gad had a very great multitude of livestock. And when they saw the land of Jazir and the land of Gilead, then indeed the region was a place for livestock. The children of Gad and the children of Reuben came and spoke to Moses, to Eleazar the priest, and to the leaders of the congregation, saying, Adaroth, Dibon, Jazir, Nimrah, Hezbon, Eliah. I, I looked these words up and listened to them last night, but <laughs> they're hard to pronounce. Um, <coughs> Sheba, Nebo, beyond the country from which the Lord defeated before the congregation of Israel is a land for livestock, and your servants have livestock. Therefore they said, if we have found favor in your sight, let this land be given to your servants as a possession. Do not take us over the Jordan. And Moses said to the children of Gad and to the children of Reuben, shall your brethren go to war while you sit here? So, so you know where we're at, right? This, we're in the wilderness wandering still. Okay, and, and at one point, and Moses is going to refer to this, um, but, you know, they, they left and they departed Egypt, and they were making their way over to the promised land, and they get over, and, and they get to the, to the Jordan, and, and they're going to cross over the Jordan, but before they do, they send out the spies, right? And, and the spies go over, and they come back, and ten of them had a bad report. There were giants in the land, and they feared them. Two of them, Joshua and Caleb, they came back and they said, land is ours, let's go. It's a land of milk and honey. Well, there was doubt and there was unbelief, and so they didn't get to cross into the, into the promised land at this time, and they go on their 40-year wilderness wandering. Well, now here we've come back 40 years, and we're full circle, and we're coming back to the point where God's getting ready to take them into the promised land. They haven't gone yet. Moses is still in control. All right. And, and during that period of time, when they were up in this region that we're talking about, they were they were in conflict with the, the residents of that the, those areas and they were gradually acquiring those lands. OK. And so they get over there. And now these these two um, Gad, Reuben and Gad are saying, hey, we've got a lot of livestock and this is a great place to raise livestock, and so we, we don't want to go over, we want this. And we're going to find out here as we continue on that it's not just Reuben and Gad, but it's also uh, half of the tribe of, of Manasseh, right? Right? Yes, yeah. Okay. Okay, so where am I? Okay, so um, let's go to verse 6. Uh, verse 5, back up a second. Therefore they said, if we have found favor in your sight, let this land be given to your servants as a possession. Do not take us over the Jordan. And Moses said to the children of Gad and to the children of Reuben, shall your brethren go to war while you sit here? Now why will you discourage the hearts of the children of Israel from going over to the land which the Lord has given to them? Thus your fathers did when I sent them away from Kadesh Barnea to see the land. This is where the the spies went in, okay? And they didn't go. They discouraged them from going in. Verse 9, For when they went up to the valley of Eshcol and saw the land, they discouraged the heart of the children of Israel so that they did not go into the land which the Lord had given to them. So the Lord's anger was aroused on that day, and he swore an oath, saying, Surely none of the men who came up from Egypt from 20 years old and above shall see the land which I swore to Abraham, Isaac, Jacob, because they have not wholly followed me, except Caleb, the son of... Yafune, I think it's the way it's pronounced, Yafune, the Ken Kenizzite, and Joshua, the son of Nun, for they have wholly followed the Lord. So the Lord's anger was aroused against Israel, and he made them wander in the wilderness for 40 years until all the generation had done evil, that had done evil in the sight of the Lord was gone. And look, you have risen in your father's place, a brood of sinful men, to increase still more the fierce anger of the Lord against Israel. For if you turn away from following him, he will once again leave them in the wilderness, and you will destroy all these people. Then they came near to him, and they said, We will build sheepfolds for our livestock in cities for our little ones. But we ourselves will be armed and ready to go before the children of Israel until we have brought them to their place. And our little ones will dwell in the fortified cities because of the inhabitants of the land. We will not return to our homes until every one of the children of Israel has received their inheritance. 
for we will not inherit with them on the other side of the Jordan and beyond, because our inheritance has fallen on us on this eastern side of the Jordan. Then Moses said, if you do this thing, if you arm yourselves before the Lord for war, and all of your armed men cross over the Jordan before the Lord until he has driven, them, driven out his enemies before him, and all the land is subdued before the Lord, then afterward you may return and be blameless before the Lord and before Israel." And this land shall be your possession before the Lord. But if you do not do so, then take note, you have sinned against the Lord, and be sure your sin will find you out. Build your cities, build cities for your little ones and your folds for your sheep, and do what, what has proceeded out of your mouth. And the children of Gad and the children of Reuben spoke to Moses, saying, Your servants will do as the Lord commands. Our little ones, our wives, our flocks, and all our livestock will be there in the cities of Gilead. But your servants will cross over every man armed for war before the Lord to battle, just as the Lord says. So Moses gave command concerning them to Eleazar the priest, to Joshua the son of Nun, and to the chief fathers of the tribes of the children of Israel. And Moses said to them, If the children of Gad and the children of Reuben cross over the Jordan with you, every man armed for battle before the Lord, and the land is subdued before you, then you shall give them the land of Gilead as a possession. But if they do not cross over armed with you, they shall have possessions among you in the land of Canaan. Then the children of Gad and the children of Reuben answered, saying, As the Lord has said to your servants, we will do. We will cross over armed before the Lord into the land of Canaan, but our possession of our inheritance shall remain with us on this side of the Jordan. So Moses gave the children of Gad, gave to the children of Gad, to the children of Reuben, and to half the tribe of Manasseh, that's where it comes in, the son of Joseph, the king of Sihon, the king of the Amorites, and the kingdom of Og, the king of Bashan, the land with its cities, with the borders, the cities of the surrounding country. Okay, so, so we see that um, Gad, Reuben Gad and this half tribe of Manasseh, they want to stay on the eastern side because the land is, they have much livestock and the land is good for, for grazing, for their sheepfolds, right? That's what we're saying, for their sheepfolds. So I'm going to pull this down one more time. I'm going to take one, one more look here. So you remember where, you remember where we're at? This is the, the Gadarenes up in this area right here, which Matthew's referring to. They come across the lake into this area, this is the Copolis area. And that's where they're at during the time of Jesus. This is what we've been reading about right here, the 12 tribes of, of, uh, of Israel as they're going to possess the land when God tells them to go in. And so now if you see, here's the, the Dead Sea. Up there is the Sea of Galilee. And this is kind of the layout. They want to stay on the eastern side. So you have Reuben down here. You have Gad up there. And you have Manasseh at the top. And what's under Manasseh? What's that say? Bashan, the area of Bashan. They defeated the king of Og, right? The area of, of Bashan. He's the king of uh, Og, the king of Bashan, right? So that's, that's the area we're talking about, and that just happens to be kind of like right where they're at. Okay? So this is land that was occupied by Israel, right? This is Israel's land, okay? And, and they wanted that because of, that's good, I think you got it. They wanted that land because of why? The graves are what? And what did he cast the two demons into? They're what? They're what, what? What ethnicity are these people? And what, is, what are the livestock over there? What's going on here? Now, now, now you, if you, we go back, and we don't have to go back there, but just recalling the text we just read, Jesus comes over the other side, land that's supposed to be occupied by Israelis, by Jews, land that was given to them as an inheritance for grazing their sheepfolds. But we got pigs. We got pigs. We don't have sheep, we have pigs. And Jesus now cast the demons into the pigs, not by accident. They're not supposed to be pigs over there. 
Those are unclean. Those are unclean animals, and the Jews should not have had pigs there. So he casts the demons into the pigs, and then the swine run down the banks, and they perish in the, into, the, into the lake. They all, they, all, they all perish there. They drown. And then the people, because they're now so religious, and they're so close to Christ, so godly now, they come over and they say, you're, you're messing with our mojo here. You just killed all our pigs. Oh, but, I, but I healed these demon-possessed guys. <laughs> but you took our pigs. How about you just leave? How about you just leave? You see where this is? You see, you see what's going on? You've got, these, you've got these people that for, okay, so... This is 1400 B.C. when they go into this land, all right, when they, Israel goes and takes this land. And so 1400 years is basically passed by until the time of Christ, until the time he steps onto the scene and this, this happens. So there's been a lot, of, a lot of history that's gone on in those 1400 years. And why did... Why did people come to, the, to, the, to North America, the U.S.? What, what were they seeking? Religious freedom, religious worship. Hmm. How about Jesus, you just go away? How about you just go away? So that we can be our they-thems and our he-she's and our transgenderism, and we can let, you know, transgender males in, into the bathrooms with our little girls, and we can do this, and we can do that, and we can have everything we want, and we can do anything we want, and we don't want you around messing with it. Don't mess with our economy. Don't mess with our stuff. Jesus, how about you just leave? Does it kind of sound familiar? Doesn't it? How did we get, how did they get from there, from taking the land as our inheritance from the Lord to being over there with no regard for the Messiah, telling them to leave and ra raising swine? Do you think it was just overnight, one step? Little by little by little by little by little by little by little. Right? Just little by little. And next thing you know, you find these tribes of Israel completely disregarding their Messiah and their raising swine. And that's exactly where we are. You know, I don't know how long it took. It's taken us you know, under 200, just over 200 years, I guess, and, you know, really escalated in the last 50. Um, but you can see how fast, how fast it happens, how you can go from a godly society to an ungodly society where you don't want, even, you don't want Jesus around even. Just go away. You're messing with, you're messing with our, live, our livelihood, or you're messing with our lives, you're messing with what we want, you're messing with our sin, you're messing with all this stuff that we don't want you messing around with. How about Jesus? You just leave. And so, you know, nationally we can see that happen. Nationally we see this happening in this text. Um, you know, this text with Matthew. But what about individually? What about individually? You know, if we look deep into our hearts, and I, and I said, you know, raise your hand if you don't think you carry any baggage. You know, what individually are we carrying around, or what individually are we tolerating or accepting that's basically just the swine? It's the swine that's in our lives. And we don't want Jesus messing with that swine in our lives. And so we're just really, hey, God, why don't you just, why don't you just stay out of that area? Why don't you just not mess with that? I kind of like that. You see where we're going here? And then how easy it can be from, man, this, this, how did this happen? He was such a godly person. She was such a godly influence. And what happened? What happened? How did they get there? 
We got there because little by little by little by little by little by little. And then suddenly, 1,400 years later or 50 years later or whatever it is, you're, you're looking back and you're going, I don't even want him in my life anymore. And that's how we can get to places like this. Or they just turn, they say, just leave, just leave. We don't want you. But the guys, they were healed, they wanted to go with him. They wanted to go. But Jesus said, no, you stay here and go tell everybody what God did for you. But the point is, we just have to watch ourselves and what we're doing. And you know, when I was, I was looking at this, and it reminded me of a particular parable of a father and two sons. And, and one of the sons was like, hey, dad, how about just give us our inheritance? Give us our inheritance now. And so he did. And that one, kind of like what we're talking about, just went out, lavish living, spending it up, doing whatever he wants. I don't care what the father thinks of me. I'm going to go live my life. I don't care what the father thinks of me. I'm going to go ahead and live my life. I'm going to do whatever. I got all this money. It's party time. Yeah, woo. And, of course, it's a parable, and it doesn't take very long to get through the text to the point where he's with, uh, he's with the swine. He's with the swine. He went from having a life in his father's house, a good life in his father's house, to living with the swine. And he's feeding the swine. And this is how good he has it now, because he's, a life with the swine is better, Right? The life of the swine is great. This is how good this guy has it now. I want to eat what they're eating. The swine got it better than I do. See where demon possession takes you? Demon oppression will take you? The swine have got it better than I do. And here they are. We don't have sheep over here anymore. We've got swine. And Jesus, don't mess with my swine. But there's good news at the end of the parable because finally he comes to his right mind. He says, man, I had it way better when I was back with my dad. Jesus, help! The waves are crashing in. I'm working as hard as I can. I'm getting nowhere. Jesus, help! My life is swine. It's taking me to a really bad place. Maybe I ought to just go back. Jesus started his ministry at the beginning here. And he said, repent, for the kingdom of God is at hand. The kingdom of heaven is at hand. Now, let me ask you something. If the kingdom of heaven was at hand, then how much closer is the kingdom of heaven now? And we can repent of whatever it is, whatever that's drawing us away, whatever little area of our lives is saying, Jesus, I don't want you in there. I don't want you messing with that. But I'm going to tell you what, you know, if it's a little area, it's going to get bigger. And then it's going to get bigger. And it's going to get bigger. And it's going to get bigger to the point where the whole thing, the whole mind, the whole body is going to be like, I really don't want Jesus messing with my swine. I don't want you messing with my sin. But the good news is, you look back and you say, Life was better when I was in him and when I was with him. Amen. And he's waiting. He's waiting for you to come back. And when you do turn and when you come back, it's rejoicing. Kill the fatted calf. The prodigal has returned. So my encouragement, I guess the two main points that I would make here is one, if you're messing with the swine, we got to turn from that. We got to repent from that. We got to give it up because it's going to take you where we don't want to go. It's going to take all of us, whoever it is, it's going to take us where we don't want to go. All right. And we can turn back because the Father is waiting. 
all right? He is waiting, and he wants us to come back. And if we're caught up in the storm, it's, our works aren't going to get us out of it. They're not going to get us out of it. We're going to have to turn to him, and even if we think he's asleep, he's listening. He knows, and he told you, we're going to the other side, and we're going to make it. And so if we're caught up in the storm, let's just trust in him. Let's show the faith rather than the works that he can take us through the storm. And he will take us through the storm. He's got a reason. Just as he had a reason to go over across the Galilee, just he had a reason to go up to Samaria and a reason to go across the Galilee, he actually had a reason for what happened and transpired while they were going across the Galilee. He's all in control. He has a plan. He's working it out. Just trust in him. Amen? Why don't we stand together and we'll close. Mm. Lord, I, I know I know we all have areas in our lives, Lord, that need to be worked on. I know there's areas, Lord, that you probably haven't even revealed to us yet that need to be worked on. Uh, little by little, Lord, we pray, we pray, we pray, Lord, that we would surrender those things in our lives, allow you to work in us, Lord, and whatever, if it's the swine we're carrying around with us, the sin we're carrying around with us, the Lord, that we would repent of that and we wouldn't say, Jesus, leave, but we'd say, Jesus, please come in. Renew us and heal us. Make us new, make us more like you. Change us, Lord, from the swine and into the sheep instead of the other way around. Help us, Lord, to embrace the admonitions of your word, the things that come out of it for the purpose of drawing us to you and making us better people, better people here, better witnesses for you for there. It'd be more about your business rather than about our own, about our own ungodly business. Help us to leave it behind. We thank you, Lord, and help us to trust in you if we're going through any trials. I know we all do at various times and at very, various levels and of intensity, Lord. We're going, to go through, we're going to go through trials and storms and help us to, as we read or recited, to be anxious for nothing and all things through our prayers and our supplications, to know that you are there, to know that you are listening, to be thankful that you are here with us, and, Lord, that you have promised us the peace that surpasses all understanding to take us through. Bless us now, Lord, as we depart from here. Just pray you'll keep us, lead us, and guide us, Lord, that we will not have bits in our mouths, Lord, but we will turn with the word. Thank you, Lord, in Jesus' name. Amen. Amen. Y'all have a wonderful afternoon.